sent out like a memo and it said that they weren't going to be buying or selling. Oh, seriously? They sold a bunch. <laughs> Hey guys, thanks for joining us. We'll probably start here in the next five minutes. Uh, if you want to drop in the chat where you're um, calling in from, we'd love to say hi. Today we got Tim and Tim with us, so it'll be a good conversation. I wonder if the, uh, wonder if the airlines did anything like they normally do where they store a bunch of the oil. If you yeah, I don't know if they're able to con control pricing. So the Carvana, yeah, Carvana is buying them, buying them from people. Are they? Yeah. Got some people coming from Ohio, neighbors nice. next door. Welcome. Indianapolis, Alex from Indianapolis. I yeah, hear that's kind of the problem Uber's having is they can't. Buying cars like none of these other. Oh, I, just, I thought it was just drivers. I think it's both resources. Yeah. So we're saying in our roundtable that uh, there are just hundreds of thousands of F 150 sitting down. Oh, I know. It. I know. It's it's 5, of them. Is it? Yeah. The other trucks are returns from Amazon. So there's like an infield. Okay. And there's like, yeah, trucks are in there. If you're just tuning in, uh, drop your location in the chat section. We'd love to say hi and see where you're calling in from. Joe had commented in our little promo video and my Penn State gear on. Oh, serious? Concerned about <laughs> the audience Alienated. we were <laughs> reaching out to. I'm sure you're the only Penn State fan on this webinar. Yeah, right. Rachel, we are worldwide. <laughs> Ask your sister, she knows. Mm hmm. Got someone on here from Charlotte, North Carolina. Nice. Wow, I'm very jealous. Rachel, you're making our uh, our <laughs> city of Cincinnati or Lawrenceburg here sound, you know, fantastic. <laughs> right? It is great, though. We just opened up the new soccer stadium, so I'm sure we're going to get a lot of people coming through. Yeah, had the opportunity to go down and see that before it opened up. Family has some, uh, or some close relatives have some uh, season tickets, so was able to go down and check that out. It's 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 amazing. That's what uh, Perry said. He said he said the next game he won't get to. Yeah, they're splitting up the yeah. amount of season ticket holders and get in. I guess they were saying on the broadcast that it sounded like the stadium was. Full capacity. They're letting the guys have the drums and yeah. sitting that. They're they're letting them all in. So. That section's staying up all night. Is that right? Are the you whole, serious? The whole cheering section. Is, it's pretty neat. And it's it's like aluminum bleachers. Yeah. So I'm sure it's like loud. Yeah. Super yeah. loud. Rachel was commenting on the the bar scene down there that all the Madtree's opening a place now down there. Oh, serious? Braxton just opened one. Braxton's, yep. that's the third one. I don't know. Is that the third one? I think so. Oh, wow. It's a nice place. Highly recommend. I love Braxton's. Second second to Crescent. <laughs> Got Rick from Tucson, Arizona. Nice. Welcome. Yeah. All right. We're about ready to get started here. It's one o'clock. Um, so if you have any questions, um, go ahead and post them as we go. Um, and the panelists will answer them the best they can. Um, 
Again, we have Tim and Tim with us today. Uh, Tim Weber comes from North Bend, Ohio. He's been in this industry for over 36 years. And if you want to know anything about bikes, just ask him. Um, yeah. And then we got Tim Williams, a national sales rep. Um, also been in this industry for a while, nine going on nine years. And um, we won't hold it against him, but he's a Penn State fan. Yeah. You'll accept it and love it. <laughs> All right, let's get started. So first um, slide, request for a quote. Yeah, so what 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 was the, the thought about this webinar is we get calls all the time, especially our engineering group. You know, uh, we, we do three, four or 500 quotes a year, so we're used to it, but a lot of folks don't really know what's involved in the quoting process. So basically, that's what this is going to be about. What do you, what do we need and what's involved in that whole process? It's interesting because, you know, you could come to, to a company with a complete ready to uh, assemble, ready to build project, or you could come with, you know, concept design. Right. Um, so really understanding when you get that project started, you know, what, what's the supplier uh, going to be looking for? You know, what, what's the requirements? Um, a lot of different details that go into the backside of the quote. Um, especially if you're reaching out to multiple companies to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples when it comes to, uh, you know, time to pull that, that trigger and make that decision. Yeah, and we always talk about it's never too early to get involved with a project. So, um, you know, I guess one of the first couple of things we always talk about is the background on the uh, on the part, you know, how'd you get here? You know, is it a new, new project? Is it an existing project? Is it approved? You know, something you're trying to approve upon? Um, also, what's the end application? Where is this part used? We've been doing this, this is our 75th year, so we've got a lot of experience personally, and uh, our company does in, in various industries. So these kind of things spur on other type of questions. Yeah, you know, absolutely. So giving the background on the project, um, you know, if it's an existing project, it, you're, you're gonna be in the, the guts and details of the issues that you had. You know, some of those issues might be the reason you're, you're searching for a new vendor, um, but you're gonna really know what the expectations are of that product where does that product end up uh what surface finish requirements are, are asked of it um is it a part being assembled is it a part being hidden um you're going to really understand being the customer uh what what you're looking for uh end goal and the issues um form fit and function really of that product uh so really detailing that out defining it for the vendor that's really trying to quote that project really helps the vendor understand um, you know what they're trying to do and the, the problem they're trying to help, help solve. Sure. All right. Awesome. So some of the first questions that we ask, we talk about, you know, material. Um, so it's with us in particular, it's the, mostly aluminum or sometimes a zinc alloy. Um, and then a lot of this information we're going to be asking is on the, is on the print. Um, but a lot of times more so than, than not, We'll get a model in so the model might necessarily have this information but material uh we would like to know is there a print and a model um and then the weight of the part we can if it's a model we can we, we can pull that right off if not you know where do we get that information um what's the scope you know what's the estimated annual usage uh what processes do it does it go through does it get cast and machined does it go through heat treating any secondaries as far as powder coating um, a big one's timeline, you know. It, it is for sure, and I think that that's really the, the start and the driving factor um, when you get into the project. You know, you take a lot of the, the information you shared there previously from material to uh, really the scope of the project, and, you know, a lot of that can be defined out by, you know, starting where, where what's the end goal, mine? when do you need the product by? Right. Um, you know, so working backwards from there uh, and using a lot of that, that scope information to help build out and meet the expectations that the customer is looking for here. Um, so if the timeline's, you know, quick, hey, you know, what, what strings can be pulled to, to get that product out quicker? Mm -hmm. um, what different processes can be looked at, uh, different solutions for uh, the problems you're having? Um, and if it's, you know, a little bit longer, uh, are there areas we want to put more uh, detail, more uh, a deeper dive or deeper scope into um, to find out some more information on if it hasn't been tested yet? What does engineering assistance mean? To, to the most folks. Yeah, you, you know, you, you hit on it earlier, um, really getting involved in a project as soon as you, you start to develop maybe a concept. Um, having an engineer involved from the beginning, I think really helps uh, define expectations. Uh, so helping the engineer understand 
what's your end goal or, or what, what you're trying to do with the product and help design uh, a manufacturability part um, you know from the end uh, backwards uh, so so having engineering assistance uh, it could be different for different companies um, you know a lot of what we see uh, is really engineering is getting involved again on the design side uh, the manufacturability and really solutions you're going to come with a design uh, it, it either will or won't be manufacturable um, but really having engineering assistance available there helps break that down and say okay yeah that didn't work but here's four possible solutions to make that work we have a great question here from sam um before we move on you guys are talking about new projects but what happens if it's an existing or like you just have a part you don't have maybe it's an older part and you don't have updated models is that something you can still quote yeah that that's a great question um we you know it's seen a lot across the industry uh what you know we kind of hit on it a little bit earlier is, is it new or is it existing if it's existing you you know a lot of the problems or the issues that you may have ran to in the past um you know uh really the concerns of the parts that you're getting in um but really you know to that point you can take any existing part and there's technology out there now that we're able to scan it uh really get a a detailed uh, model of what that part currently looks like and if that part's currently working for you you know you you have that accurate model of what you need so if it's a retool or if it's a current tool, uh, you are able to develop, you know, a 3D model from that scanning technology. Yeah, that scanning technology is a really pretty nice stuff. I mean, it's actually something you can use to not only do what Tim's saying is develop a, a model, but also to compare the model that you've got to the final part. And so the scanning is 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 huge. Yeah, and it's 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 used a lot too on on new product. Um, you know, form, fit, and function to make sure it it fits up to the model and the print that was originally developed. Um, again, really just making sure you're meeting expectations of the, the customer and then goal in mind. So the answer is yes, absolutely yes. That's something that we can we do and anybody should be able to help you out with as far as taking an existing part and getting it into a new tool. Great. Good Thanks, question. Guys. Quote turnaround time. So I'm going to let you handle that one, Tim, because you've yeah. been diving into that for a while. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, quote, quote turnaround time. Uh, Again, it goes to the timeline of the product. So when you're trying to launch the market is really a, a big driving factor often. Um, you know, but taking that that uh, quote and really trying to get it back to the customer um, to make sure that the customer understands, you know, in timely fashion, what we quoted, how we quoted it, um, and making sure that it's lining out to what they want. Um, and then also to make sure that they are uh, easily, you know, if, if, it, if it's been shopped, it's, it's being looked at multiple sources that they can compare those apples to apples. Um, you know, with the, the type of process that, that's being done uh, in a casting industry, it's a very, very custom quote. Um, you know, especially if you're adding a lot of that scope that we talked about on the previous slide, you, there's a lot of time and effort that go into the different functions. Um, you know, if you're, you're casting only, yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty simple, uh, a quick turnaround on the quote, usually um, day or less type of thing. But if you're going uh, you know, casting, heat treating, polishing, machining operations, uh, coating operations. There's a lot of detail that goes into that. And it's not just those um, those ops themselves. You got to think about all the molds and fixtures that go with them. Um, you know, so typical, would three to 10 days be fair to say? The typical? So, so typical, I'd say three to 10 days for sure. Right. Um, you know, what we try to do is we, we target five days or less. You're, you're trying to get a, a product, uh, you know, an understanding of what it's going to cost you to do this, whether you're at concept stage or you're ready to launch the market. Um, you, you don't have time to wait either way. You're, you're trying to get what that cost is. If you need to make adjustments on the front end on the concept design or if you're ready to go in and pull that trigger uh, to get it to market. Um, How do you build the quote? So you, you do that. You look at um, a lot of different options that we talked about some on the previous slide. You start. You know, with timeline, uh, we look at the different ops that go into it, the different scope that go into it, um, really break it down from a high level and say, okay, you know, here's what they're looking for, uh, the different types of, of uh, operations that are needed to get that part through. Um, you know, what, what the way it used to be done too, from an estimated annual standpoint, would a customer or prospect would come in and really define out, hey, I want 100 or 200 piece releases. And even though they give you that estimated annual, um, you know, there might be the possibility to maximize uh, setup and minimize setup costs at a higher run quantity. So understanding that estimated annual, now we try to back into 
maximizing setup rather than um, you know the 100 200 piece releases that are, that are originally requested. And that information is walked through with with the customer or prospect to make sure they understand why we did that. Um, you know to really make sure that again we're, we're minimizing the cost back to the customer rather than um, you know if they do have defining 100 200 piece releases that maybe they don't have storage for it. Yeah, that's not an issue. You know, we, 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 we can work on that. Okay. You kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but we got a good question in on how do you handle um, in process changes or modifications during quoting process, or even maybe potentially down into production process? That's a good question. So uh, what we do is we, when we build the, um, we build the quote, we have rate calculators uh, for all the different options, all the different operations. Like, so we have a rate calculator for the casting part of it, yep. a rate calculator for, you know, the machining, so on and so forth. Um, so depending on what the uh, the change is, it may or may not have an effect. For instance, at one point on a particular product, um, it was a pressure type vessel and they wanted to add in a pressure test. So we were able to just uh, be flexible enough that we could do the pressure test while the part was being machined. So it changed the operation, but it didn't add any cost. So we're trying to figure out how to maneuver, how to be flexible with that change so that it doesn't affect uh, what, you know, what, the, what the customer's already got dialed into his uh, formula. Um, and also, is it something that we can do you know, as a secondary? Do it doesn't need to be, can, or can we cast it in? So it, it just depends. Um, but it's it, as soon as you're aware that there could be some sort of a, a change or some modification, and they, hey, they happen all the time. As soon as you know, just to make the uh, the foundry aware, so that they can kind of you know, look forward as far as okay, what product is this going to affect? Is it going to affect the you know if it's a new tool, not so much a, a problem. Uh, if it's a change on the fly, okay, we maybe have some inventory, or you have some inventory you need to modify. So you know, just that communication you know, as soon as possible, getting with the uh, the foundry, I think, is is, is beneficial. Yeah, and I, you know, Tim hit on a really good point there. Um, so, so BPI, our, our sales teams, trained to really ask the the pertinent questions. Um, but really, what we're trying to do today is inform, uh, you know, the prospect or, or customer here that a lot of these details are what go into uh, working up that quote. So, you know, making sure that those those questions are answered. But when we come in and we take those that information. The BPI, we develop it into a, a higher level algorithm um, quoting module that, again, you know, you come in and you have a different revision change on your line, um, you know, it's easy for us to plug and play and make that adjustment on the fly. And it's a kind of question, it's a good question that you should ask the foundry up front. You know, what happens, in, you know, what happens if this, you know, because especially if it's a new product, you know, not everything works as it's drawn up and there might be some additional flexibility on some of the other parts that go into the assembly that made up. So uh, it's just something to be aware of, but it's it's not that unusual. Awesome, thanks. So uh, we mentioned a little bit about the uh, the algorithm and the, the quoting module that we have built uh, custom at Batesville Products. Um, what it really starts with, in, in you know basic upfront, which we're trying to do here, is develop a tool. Um, so a casting tool that's going to cast your product successfully into the the requirements that you're looking for. Um, so what we look at when we're developing that, that tooling really up front um, really starts with the three items you see on the screen here. Um, so Batesville Products uh, specifically works on, and a lot of foundries should be using this, um, but not all do, uh, is, an, is a finite element analysis. Really getting in to see, you know, how that, that part flows the way it's currently set up and designed, um, you know, how the metal flows, if there's any hot or cool sections, if there's any air entrapment. Uh, but also doing it from the mold perspective. Um, same thing. Do we, you know, are there there uh, uh, cores that need to be added? Are there cooling uh, areas or, or vents that need to be added? Um, you know, how do we make sure that that part is ejected um, and, and does what it needs to uh, and and part? And that's where the FAA starts, and that really gets you into that mold design. It's it's it, we found it to be critical. It's a time saver. That's the other thing. It's a little bit of a few more dollars, but in the long run, it really pays for itself and. Uh, there are so many really great softwares out there and tooling companies that have various uh, options. But, um, you know, we, we do it on every single tool and we've actually found it to be beneficial to do it on tools that we've already got in production. So 
um, rather than fighting a problem over the years, you you, you make a, a, an FEA after the, after the process has already started, after we've already got them old, cavities are cut. Um, you know, and the other thing that Tim mentioned was uh, it really affects your 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 piece price is is the uh, the mold design and might move on to the next calculator, which is the foundry calculator, which follows tooling. Um, and how how important is the design up front? You know, if it's a high runner, you know, how many cavities can you get in there? And again, it goes back to the FEA. Is that going, is that doable? You know, hey, we're going to put six cavities in here. Well, now you've superheated a, a section of the mold that maybe it's not going to work. So um, those kind of things, those kind of questions, that kind of information is is, is important uh, for the foundry to, uh, you know, come up with a, a cost on it. Yeah, and I, you know, I think you hit on it too. It's it's key because the FEA is done before you even cut the mold. Right. So it, it's almost guaranteeing that you're going to be pouring the good casting the way you want to pour good casting before you even cut that mold. Yep. Um, you know, so where you're seeing the benefits of that are down line, you know, you talk just about the foundry, but it, it ultimately goes all the way down line. Yep. Um, so is it's, it's FEA awesome. something um, all foundries use? Um, it is not. Um, unfortunately, it's not. Uh, we, you know, here we, we were using it off and on uh, for, for years um, until five to ten years ago, we made it automatic every time we do a new mold. And that that's the reason being, you know, we, we, we want to make sure we're giving you a good part before we even cut that mold. So why not, you know, let's not waste the time, the money, and the effort, you know, before we, we even get in there and cut that mold. Right. And and that information is always shared with the customer. So whatever foundry you're using, they should be doing some sort of uh, simulation and they should share that with you up front. There's no reason not to. And they're just cool. Yeah, they are. They're very <laughs> cool looking. Yeah. So again, the foundry calculator, uh, I'll let Tim talk about this because he's developed the um, the system for it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there, there's a lot of different uh, items that go into making sure that we are developing an accurate cost and rate uh, on the foundry uh, side of things. So when we're just pouring the casting is what we're looking at here. Um, so looking at a net weight versus gross weight, uh, Tim hit on a little bit on that previous uh, slide there. But are, is there a multiple cavity? Is it a single cavity? Um, you know, the time that goes into that part, uh, you know, what, what, what ultimate metal is coming out in that net, that net product, if you saw off gates and risers that, you know, really is resulting in the, the, the casting that you're looking for versus, you know, how does those uh, gates and risers really affect your, your part? Um, we also dig down deep into the specific types of equipment that are used for it. Um, so there's there's different size uh, pieces of equipment. There's there's big, there's small, there's medium. I mean, you know, you go out to the market and look for casting equipment. There's there's all sorts of different technology. Um, there's some some specific technology that Batesville Products built here, um, specific to a, a reverse tilt pour option as well. Um, you know, there's static uh, pouring is you know on top of that. Um, a lot of different avenues to really uh, dive into when you're talking about a permanent mold casting, let alone other casting opportunities. Correct. That's right. Uh, machining calculating is, is very similar. Again, Tim developed a system for um, uh, an in-house machine calculator. And there's a, there's a lot of programs out there that are available, you know, that a lot of foundries use. Um, there's a lot of ways to come up with the rates. Um, but again, it, it, your machining cost is, is related to how complex the part is. Uh, the tolerancing obviously um, goes, you know, if it's a something that's a three place, four place, you know, type tolerance so that that dictates a certain amount of inspection. Um, how many you inspect? What type of you know? What type of equipment do you need? Uh, what type of tools do you need? Not only to produce the part, but what kind of tools do you need to inspect the part? Um, is this something that can be done online? Is this something you want to you know, have the operator checking, or is this something that you pull offline and have the uh, and take it into the inspection department and have them check tolerances and surface finishes and that type of thing, um, different type of comparators. So the machining calculator again can be very simple, um, you know, drill tap holes or you know a lot of milling, cutting, you know, grooves, boring, um, you know, broaching operations. They can get very involved. So again, it's it's up to uh, if the part dictates it, and again, but it's one of those things that the discussion up front, you know, can we cast something versus does it have to be a, a machined in feature? So um, that's that's a big driver of cost. 
Yeah, and I, I, that's that's the point right there. Is really making sure either the foundry or the custom shop that you're working with really understands the costs that are going into it. Um, you know, again, the detail that, that Tim just talked about, and we've talked about on previous slides, is really understanding the end customer and end goal in mind, but understanding our own costs as well to make sure that we're providing something that's competitive. We know it's going to get you what you want. Um, and it, it's cost efficient for, for the customer. Right, right. Um, you know, but hitting all the, the requirements that that customer needs from tolerancing, fit, surface finish, um, coatings, heat treatings, you know, things of that nature, you know, really understanding and diving deep into what those costs mean for that customer. And another driver of cost is machine, the machining equipment. I mean, the feeds and speeds on machines today is, is just, it's, it's amazing. And, and how quick you can get that tool changed, how quick you're making chips. Um, you know, the type of uh, coolant you're using. I mean, there's so much that goes into it. And, you know, when you're choosing the, the, this machine shop, if it should be a part of the, uh, hopefully part of the foundry, um, you know, seeing what kind of equipment they actually have and what kind of inspection equipment they have. That, those are two two important factors. Yeah, it's, it's not as simple as you think it would be when you, when it comes to machining. You're not just taking a part over there and taking one tool. Um, you know, there's a lot of time and money that can be saved by, you know, the way you program it. Yeah. So, cool. Awesome. There was one question and it kind of jumps back a little bit um, to kind of your mold questions, but um, is it possible to take a, an existing die cast and quote it to see if you can change it to permanent mold? Is that a possibility at all? Uh, it, it is. Great uh, question. It, yeah, yeah. It, it, sometimes it is. Uh, so it's a it's slightly different process, but what you're talking about is basically using the cavity. Uh, so that has been done in the past. It's not um, it's not ideal, but you know if you've got the basic um, die cast mold and you've got the cavity, you know you're you're pretty much you know two thirds of the way there. You can be now. You still have to figure out the uh, how you're getting the metal into the mold. You got to figure out the gating system, knockout system, um, and again, what I would recommend in a situation like that is scan it and then do another um, do an FEA to see what you've got because um, the FEA will tell you, and I don't mean just an FEA, the simulation will tell you. You know where you can uh, you might have turbulence where you're going to have hot spots that type of thing and if you've got an existing tool you know you got to work with what you've got so um, can you make this thing work and yes it's been done in the past a lot of a lot of times too I think the you know you see that when die castings um, you know some of their volumes uh, come down from their their initial spike at the mm -hmm. beginning of the project um, so you know we had a, a previous webinar where we talked a lot about you know really defining out the process it should be going you know, if, if die casting parts start coming down too, you know, but it's still live active product for, for years to come, um, a lot of times that die casting, uh, you know, should be converted into a permanent mold rather than the die casting that it's in. You know, so if that, that tool wear and tear over life uh, and you're starting to run lower quantities, you could see, you know, uh, cost benefits uh, transferring that from a die casting to a permanent mold. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, good question. Um, a lot of great questions, guys. Um, it looks like we've kind of come to the end, but if you have any more questions, um, please shoot them our way. We'd be happy to answer them. Um, we'll also be in Atlanta next week for the Design to Part show. So stop by if you're in the area and we'll um, be happy to talk more quotes or answer any questions there. But thank you, Tim and Tim. This was uh, great. and. Uh, Hope to see you guys for the next webinar. Thank you. Thanks.